We, as woodworkers, end up having to interact with metal, like it or not. If you're not comfortable working with metal, or you don't know how to work with metal, you may be really limiting your skills and the things that you can do with metal. If all you do all day is sit around and hand cut dovetails with tiny little pens and use scrapers to prep your furniture for that hand rubbed French polish, you probably don't need to listen to this episode. But if you're like the rest of us who build jigs, repair broken tools because we're too cheap to hire someone to fix it for us, or if you make new tools, you might want to listen to this episode. Hi, my name's Roger Kugler. This is Working at Woodworking Podcast, where I hope to inspire you to take your hobbyist woodworking skills and go pro. Serve your community. Help your neighbors. Rebuild that rocking chair. Refinish that kitchen cabinet. Build that side table that Mrs. Smith had always wanted. And make some money doing it. So how do we interact with metal? We use metal all the time in our woodworking. We use screws, sometimes nails. No, nails are not a bad word in woodworking. We also will use nuts and bolts and machine screws. Let's say you're building a jig and you need to attach a piano hinge to a piece of quarter inch plywood. Well, in normal times, you might use half-inch or three-quarter-inch plywood, but hey, plywood's expensive. We're going with the thin stuff. And so you set all the screws, but now they're poking out the backside of the quarter-inch plywood. What do you do? Well, you're going to have to interact with metal. You could grab a file and start filing those screws off. Gosh, does that sound painful. Or you might think that you could use a sander and sand them off, yeah, that's not going to work so well. If it's a small piece, you could actually pick it up and take it over to your bench grinder and grind the tips off. I've done that with a lot of projects. As long as you can get it to fit into the grinder, that works perfectly fine. If it's a larger piece, you might need to take the grinder to the workpiece. You could chuck a grindstone into a drill and with a very steady and braced hand, grind those little suckers right off. Maybe a Dremel-style tool could be used to grind those off. Or you could grab an angle grinder with virtually any metal cutting disc on there and make very short work of it. Perhaps you're building a lumber storage rack. Yeah, how many times are you going to do that in your life? And you went to the hardware store and you bought the the bolts that you were going to use to bolt this thing together because, well, you know you're going to take it apart someday and redesign it. And the bolts are too long. You bought quarter 20 and you didn't compensate just right. And these things, the smooth part of the bolt is longer than the two pieces of two before put together, three inches. You only need about a half inch more thread, and this could work perfectly fine. Well, you could make another trip back to the hardware store, or you could reach for your die set. A die is a chunk of metal that's used to cut threads. Chuck your bolt into the vise, grab your die, quarter 20, and just extend those threads deeper into the smooth shaft, and boom, problem solved. It took you like maybe 45 seconds to do that. Maybe you bought a Wixy digital readout for your table saw. You know that I've trumpeted those before. I would really hate to live without mine. And it says that you need to drill holes and mount the scale under that rectangular tube that your fence slides on. So you drill the hole, you put the bolt through, and now you got to figure out how you're going to hold the nut 16 inches inside the tube that you can't reach. Another way of doing that would be to tap a hole in the bottom of that rectangular tube and simply screw in a machine screw. Problem solved. Easy peasy. And to do that, you're going to use a tap. 
A tap is a device that's used to cut threads in a hole. And when you put these together, you end up with a tap and die set. Very, very handy to have. Very easy to use. Not rocket science at all. And that tap can come in very handy for other projects. Let's say you're building a jig or a fixture to hold something to run through some machine. But you need these parts to be removable. You could use wood screws, but, you know, a wood screw, after it's been taken out five or six times, the threads kind of break down and it's not real reliable, not very repeatable. You could use your tap and actually tap wood especially plywood. It works very well. Now, I wouldn't, you know, suspend my body weight off of something like that, but for something, you know, as simple as a jig or fixture, it's going to work quite well. Here's a little pro tip. Use some thin CA glue and saturate those threads after you've cut them. Run the tap back in to kind of clean it out, and that CA glue is really going to strengthen and reinforce those wooden threads. They will last a long, long time. And you can back the metal screw out as many times as you need. It's going to work very well. Let's say you bought some quarter 20 bolts for your lumber rack and they are just way too long. You need to cut those off a little bit. Again, simple metal working task. Screw on a nut on that bolt. Clamp it in your vise. Use your favorite metal cutting device and cut the bolt to the required length. Why put the nut on first? Because you can back that nut off and it will kind of clean up the threads from your hacksaw or metal cutting blade. Take that over to the grinder and just put a little bit of a chamfer on it and it's factory new. You can put nuts on, take them off, perfectly clean does a very, very good job. Otherwise, you cut the bolt off and you take it to the grinder to clean up and there's always just a little bit of metal that kind of hangs up in there and it makes the the, the nut just harder to get to get on that first time. So if you put the nut on first and then back it out, it cleans that up and it works beautiful. Let's say you're setting up a dado stack to cut dados in the sides of a bookcase and plywood these days when we can get it the thicknesses can kind of be all over the place so you do a test cut put your plywood shelf in there and it's loose how loose is it well if you would reach for your feeler gauge you could tell exactly a feeler gauge is nothing more than this little contraption that has various thicknesses of metal down to the thousandths of an inch you want to see what three thousandths of an inch is there is a feeler gauge that you can literally see what three thousandths of an inch is or ten thousandths of an inch or twenty thousandths of an inch you stick your feeler gauge in there and see that you're eight thousandths of an inch off, you can go to your shim packet and select the eight thousandths or maybe even the ten thousandths to give you a little bit of of play and put that on your dado stack and your cut is going to be perfect. And while we're talking about bolts and screws, let's take a moment and talk about diameter and pitch. Whenever you go to the hardware store and pick up the quarter 20 screws, what exactly does that mean? Well, a quarter is the diameter of that bolt, and the 20 refers to the pitch of the threads. Now, pitch is the diagonal rotation around the axis the number of times in one inch. Okay, that really kind of sucks as a definition, but you get the idea. It's the number of threads per inch, kind of like the TPI, the tips per inch in saw. So let's not go there. So a quarter 20 is going to be a quarter inch in diameter, 20 threads per inch. Or a three quarter by 16 is going to be three quarters in diameter, 16 threads per inch. Now here's a little tip. If you're building some type of a jig or a fixture that you need to move to adjust, if you use a 16-pitch thread, 
that means that one revolution of that thread is going to move a sixteenth of an inch. That can come in real handy if you're building like a jig to do, you know, to cut tenons or to do, you know, finger joints or something like that. You know, three revolutions, you have moved at three sixteenths of an inch. Very, very convenient. The math doesn't work out quite as well with a quarter 20 because that's 20 inch 20 threads per inch and you can kind of see the difficulty you might use a 1032 nut and bolt combination well that 10 refers to the diameter but now we get into the wire gauge sizes and a number 10 would actually be about 0.19 inches in diameter. You can get a number 8, number 6, so on and so forth. The 32 refers to 32 threads per inch. That's quite fine. In fact, it's even designated as fine. You could also get a 1024, which would be considered a coarse threaded screw. 24 inches per inch. Simple, right? Yeah, okay. Moving on, I would encourage everyone to pick up the pocket reference book. This is a little, literally, pocket-sized book that you can keep in your toolbox, keep in your workbench. It has all kinds of knowledge in it. It's published by uh, Thomas uh, Glover. Oftentimes, a company will will put their own uh, brand on the cover. I have an old one uh, from Ace Hardware. There is just all kinds of stuff in this. You know, here's a, a you know, there's a whole chapter on machine screws and sizes and what your pilot bit should be for setting a wood screw. There's uh, first aid section, puncture wounds to the torso. Wow, that sounds interesting. And we can go to standard dry torque for coarse threaded non-ferrous and stainless steel bolts. I mean, you've been probably looking for that information for quite a while, and sometimes the internet's not all that great on finding things for us. What about wire size vol versus voltage drop? You have a little worksite set up out in the back 40. You have a 300-foot extension cord running out there. If you're pumping 15 amps into that cord, how many amps actually reaches your tool 300 feet away? Well, you can look it up in this little table, and it will tell you. There's things on time zones. There's things on propane, propane tank sizes. This thing is just a wealth of information. I mean, literally, Google would be jealous of this little book. There is so much information in it. And they're not expensive. Uh, this was uh, $12.29 um, yeah, a few years ago. But you can find them. I would strongly recommend you, you, you pick one of those up. And while you're at the hardware store, I'd also recommend that you pick up a thread gauge. Now, much like the feeler gauge, the thread gauge measures, yeah, threads. So if you're not sure if this is a quarter 20 or a 1024, you just whip out one of the little leafs and hold it up to the thread, and you can match the thread of your bolt to the thread leaf on the thread gauge. But it doesn't quite match up. If you hold it up to the light, you can still... See quite a bit of daylight between there. Oh, heh, I bet you have a metric thread. Yeah, good luck with that. Well, if you look on the other end of the thread gauge, that's the metric side. And oftentimes, they're a different colored metal just to further distinguish the two. So it might end up being a, you know, a 1.5 or even a 1 uh, millimeter uh, threads per inch. It gets into all of the metric sizes, is very convenient to have. I, they're not terribly expensive. Pick one of those up, have it in your toolbox, it'll come in hand. Okay, so we've talked about taps and dies and feeler gauges and thread pitch. Let's talk about cutting metal. Now, in the last episode where I talked about mechanics in the workshop, we talked about hacksaws. You've got to have a hacksaw in your woodworking shop. In fact, hacksaws are kind of underappreciated. I remember reading an article in 
a wooden boat magazine issue oh a number of years ago about a man up in Maine. He was an old boat builder, and he also built furniture. He used a hacksaw to cut all of his dovetails. Yeah, a hacksaw. I mean, he didn't spend $300 for a boutique, you know, dovetailing saw. He used a hacksaw. And from the description in the article, he did absolutely superb work. So anyway, hacksaws typically are used for hacking away at metal. Bolts too long, hacksaw. You need to cut a piece of brass off to make a little indicator, you know, for a machine that the plastic one has finally self-destructed. Hacksaw. In fact, hacksaws are so inexpensive, I'd pick up two. Put a fine blade in one, put a coarse blade in the other. If you're cutting really hard materials, like maybe annealed tool steel, use the fine blade. If you're cutting something, you know, kind of coarse or heavy, that's where the the coarse blade is going to make fast work of that. One of my favorite tools for cutting metal is a four inch angle grinder and a cutoff disc. I've mentioned my little jet six inch joiner that I bought off of Craigslist. Price was right. It's been a good little joiner. I'm not going to call it a a highly precise woodworking tool, but it gets the job done. One incredibly annoying thing about it is that the gentleman whom I bought this from put little two-inch casters on a makeshift base. That was horrible. Every time I had to move the thing, it would get caught on a piece of sawdust, you know, and just kind of jam up. Incredibly frustrating. So during my my caster purge of my workshop, I wanted to replace those two-inch casters with four-inch casters. They will run up and over almost anything in the workshop. But to do that, I had to cut down the metal skeleton stand that the joiner sat upon. I could have used a hacksaw, yeah, a little bit of elbow grease there, but I reached for the four-inch angle grinder with a metal cutting disc in it. Oh my gosh, it's actually fun to cut metal with that because it's so fast and you can't discount the spark trail that that leaves for good entertainment value. So if you don't have a 4-inch grinder, I would recommend you check one out. And you can use that for woodworking also. There's the, I think it's called the Lancelot Disc Set that you can use for, for hollowing out uh, bowls. Uh, Arbortech, I think, makes some uh, discs that are, are very popular, very effective at, at hollowing out you know bowls, sculpting wood, shaping wood. And there's one disc that has basically chainsaw teeth all around it. That might be the Lancelot. That is just scary looking. <laughs> I would think maybe two or three times before I would use that. That that could get you in, in some trouble there. But a angle grinder is a very efficient, very good tool to have in a workshop. Now let's take a quick moment and talk about metal itself. Basically, we can divide them into two categories, ferrous and non-ferrous metals. Now, the ferrous metals, FE, is basically the iron-based metals, the steel, you know, the hard stuff, the good stuff, the things that our, our chisels are made out of. Very, very hard, very, very tough. And then we have the non-ferrous metals. These are, well, comparatively... Soft metals, brass, bronze, tin, zinc, things like that. Lead certainly would be considered a soft, non-ferrous metal. Now, you can use a lot of your woodworking equipment to cut non-ferrous metals. Yeah, I know, half of you just shuddered thinking about running a piece of brass through your chop saw or your bandsaw. But if you're using, particularly if you're using, you know, carbide uh, teeth, it's not going to be a problem at all. Of course, follow all, you know, good safety procedures as, you, as you're doing that because it's not going to act exactly like wood. One of the first things you're going to notice is that unlike sawdust, non-ferrous dust actually 
hurts whenever it hits bare skin. It's hot and it's sharp and it's not pleasant to to experience that. So long sleeves, maybe gloves, and certainly uh, safety glasses and perhaps a face shield would be very much in order. Now, there's been a number of articles in the various woodworking magazines of late of using non-ferrous metals in your woodworking, particularly as inlay. And they go through and they talk about, you know, how to cut it and how to handle it. Typically, you don't have to really get into the heat treating process that you would with the ferrous metals. So it's much simpler, much easier to use. How about some silver inlay in that nice walnut credenza that you're building? That could be really sharp and a little bit expensive right now, but that could be very, very unique, really kind of set off that piece. Other ways that you can cut metals, a jigsaw with a metal cutting blade. You have a hacksaw to cut that piece of steel? Well, you could put a metal cutting blade in your jigsaw, and now you have a automatic power tool driven hacksaw. It actually works quite well, particularly if you're cutting like sheet metal or something like that. Use a very fine toothed metal cutting blade at a slow speed. Because it's going to vibrate. It's going to kind of kick and, you know, fight back. But once you kind of get into a groove there, it can work incredibly well. And if you're getting into the real fine stuff, like maybe marquetry or inlay, you can turn to your scroll saw with a very fine tooth blade or even a jeweler's saw to do some very intricate, you know, scroll type work for your marquetry or your inlay. Other tools you'll need, a drill press and a set of good twist bits. Now, not all twist bits are made equally. You pretty much get what you pay for. If you go into Harbor Freight and pick up a set of, you know, like, 64 bits, they're not going to probably be as high a quality as buying from a, a supply house, you know, like Grinder or, or McMaster Car. It comes down to how those drill bits are tempered. I heard a story that on the real inexpensive Asian imports, they only heat treat the major sizes, like eighth inch, quarter inch, three-eighths, so on and so forth, because those are the sizes that are going to be used most often. You know, your 1364 don't even bother to heat treat those, because who actually uses the 1364 drill bit? So, yeah, you kind of get what you pay for. When you're drilling metal, I think it's very important that you clamp the metal down. You don't want a piece of metal getting caught in a twist bit and helicoptering on. That's where the thing starts going around and around and around. And we, being dumb humans, have this instinctive reflex of trying to stop it. And we reach out and we grab the helicoptering piece of metal and we slice and dice our hand, even before we realize what stupid thing we just did. So make sure that metal's clamped down. You can get away with that with a piece of wood. You're not going to get away with it with a piece of metal. Now, if you pick up one of these little machinist drill press vices, they're not very expensive. I got one from Grizzly a number of years ago. I'm sure I didn't pay more than 20 bucks for it. And let that hold your metal. That comes in really handy. So check that out. Also, when you're drilling metal, particularly ferrous metal, lubrication. A little drop of three-in-one oil goes a very long way. If you start hearing squeals, you know, like a dying rabbit, that means that you're building up heat in that metal and you are really starting to suck the temper out of your drill bit. You're going to dull and ruin your drill bit. A little bit of metal keeps that moving. You'll see a little wisp of smoke coming up through there. Of course, if you see fire, you know, you've got other issues, but that's really going to help that bit cut. And slow down your speed. You don't need to be running at 1200 RPM. If you really want to get into it, go to the pocket reference 
and it will tell you exactly what speed you should be using to cut what size of hole through what type of metal through a what thickness. It's all in there. And I mentioned this before, but having a bench grinder, you might already have a bench grinder, particularly if you're into keeping a really good edge on your tools, especially if you have concrete floors in your workshop. So you probably have a bench grinder. Typically, they come with a carborinium stone, which is kind of a man-made, well, I don't know exactly what it is, but it cuts metal really, really well. Ferrous metal. I want to repeat that. Use a bench grinder to cut steel. Don't use a bench grinder to cut brass, bronze, aluminum, any soft metal. There's horror stories about people using a soft metal on a bench grinder. It clogs up the pores of the carborinium wheel and stresses build up, heat builds up, and the bloody thing explodes, sending shrapnel throughout the shop. Personally, I've never experienced it, but personally, I don't use the grinder on non-ferrous metals. If you need to grind non-ferrous metals, that's why they made sandpaper. If you have one of those little, you know, six-inch wide belt sanders, usually with the nine-inch disc combination. I bought mine at Menards years ago for like $140. I mean, it is it is so stupidly cheap that it should be an embarrassment for me to, to even mention that I bought the Tool Shop brand. Other than having to kind of modify the platen on that, it has just worked out really, really well. Okay, there was a one part that fell off that I had to grab my handy dandy tap and die set and reset the threads in it. But other than that, it's worked really well. Did I mention it was like $140? But use that sanding belt on your, your brass and, and aluminum and things like that. You're not going to blow anything up and it's going to do a really, really, really good job. They do make all kinds of different wheels for your grinders. There's ceramic alumina uh, by 3M. There's aluminum oxide wheels that cut very cool, very fine. I have one wheel set up for grinding my wood turning tools. And wood turners lately have been really getting into the cubic boron nitride, the CBN wheels incredibly expensive. Well, what do you expect for diamonds, even if they are synthetic? But apparently they do just a marvelous job on the real high-tech, high-end steels that are being used for some wood-turning tools. I've heard that it's not all that great for your standard high-speed steel, you know, that the rest of us mortals use. But you know, for the really good stuff, that seems to be kind of the ticket there. You know, I mentioned safety a little earlier. Uh, the other thing to consider in addition to your personal safety is fire safety. We work in wood working shops, which means there's a lot of wood around and sawdust and that real, real, real fine dust it just kind of gets every place. Not exactly the place to be throwing sparks all over. Now, I know that there's a very low probability of igniting sawdust by using a grinder, but still, we have wood, we have sparks, which is like super hot metal. Let's not tempt fate here. Let's be safe. Sweep up the sawdust have a clear area whenever we're working with metals. And just to be on the safe side, make sure that your fire extinguisher is up to date and near one of the exits. Not sitting right beside you where you have to go through the fire to get to the fire extinguisher, but someplace clear of the work area. And I was watching uh, YouTube, uh, one of Stumpy Nub's videos, and he mentioned fire blankets. I had never heard of such a thing. With a little bit of Mr. Google, yeah, these are a real thing. They're kind of made out of like a fiberglass material. The one I saw on Amazon was 
40 inches by 40 inches. And there's other YouTube videos of like fire department personnel showing how to use these things to put out, you know, kitchen fires or campfires that get away or that deep frying frozen turkey thing that your brother-in-law tried on his wood deck. Yeah, these things work really well. I could see that they could be very handy in the workshop. Also, not very expensive. So check out Stumping Nubs. Check out uh, Amazon for those. Other metalworking tools for your woodworking shop, a good machinist vice. I mean, you probably have, I don't know, two or three woodworking vices, but that's not going to work at all for metal. You need a good machinist vice. They're not horribly expensive, but the good ones can be quite pricey. Yard sales, auctions, you can find them for 25 bucks, 50 bucks. You don't need the highest quality. Again, this might be where Harbor Freight comes in. If you're not doing this, you know, full time in your profession, yeah, this is a place to save a little bit of money. But a machinist vice is going to be worth its weight in gold, except for space. They do kind of take up a little bit of space that you can't really mount that at the end of your miter saw station because, well, then that's going to interfere with something long that you put on. What I've seen a lot of woodworkers do is they mount the machinist vise on like a piece of three quarter inch plywood with a T coming off of it that they can then set on their woodworking bench and clamp with their woodworking vise. And when they don't need it, they can simply take it off and put it in a convenient storage uh, area. That should work quite well, actually. What about an anvil? Well, you're working with metal, and sometimes you have to hammer metal, and that's where an anvil comes in handy. Now, there is a little flat spot, a little tiny anvil on good machinist vice, but usually they're kind of either too small or not in the right position that you can do real effective work with. And so a small anvil could be very, very handy. Now, if we're talking large anvils and we're talking some major bucks, it is amazing how much these things are selling for now. I mean, blacksmithing is kind of becoming a thing. There's TV shows, History Channel, you know, Forged in Fire, that it's become a very popular hobby, pastime, and for some people, profession, which is wonderful. I love to see, you know, the skill being acquired, being being developed with this, but it's also made anvils very, very expensive. You don't need a huge anvil. And for the casual worker, again, maybe going to the good old HF store could be a good solution. If you happen to see a railroad rail just kind of lying around someplace, they make good anvils also. I have a chunk of railroad rail. It's about, I don't know, 14 inches long or so. I've, I've used a four inch grinder to shape a horn onto it. It works very well and it was like free. It's not a bad idea to have some metal working hammers such as like a ball peen hammer, maybe a cross peen hammer. Your S wing claw hammer, eh, might not be the best thing for beating away at a piece of steel. Okay, let's talk about joining metal. How do we do that? Well, you can always drill a hole and put a bolt through to join two pieces of metal. Or if it's thin metal, sheet metal, you can use a sheet metal screw. Exactly what they're made for. You could also use metal to join metal together. Solder. Solder can come in very handy. A soldering kit is not very expensive, and if you have any bend to doing any type of electronics work, a nice soldering outfit is very handy. You can use solder to solder brass together. You might also consider brazing. Brazing is using higher temperatures with other types of base metals to join metal together. 
brazing creates a much stronger joint, and we see that used in the HVAC industry all the time. Welding. Yes, learn how to weld. This is where you can really incorporate metal into your woodworking. People make table bases out of steel, maybe give it a special finish, special patina, put this giant, beautiful piece of slab hardwood on top of it with a beautiful finish. You're only limited by your imagination once you pick up a welder and start going down that rabbit hole. And what we've been basically talking about here is smithing, shaping metal. There's blacksmithing, you know, where you're literally taking a chunk of metal, heating it up, and then reshaping it into another thing, such as a tool. And then there's white smithing, where jewelers would be considered a white smith, where they're taking, you know, a piece of non-ferrous metal and shaping it typically without heat to change the shape and the purpose of that piece of metal. And in between is kind of a gray spot or gray smithing where we don't use a forge, but we will break out the propane torch and heat up a piece of metal to reshape that. So what do you do with all these newfound metalworking skills that you've been developing? Well, for one thing, you can make your own tools. If you're into lathe turning, lathe tools are really expensive. And just a quick trip to McMaster Car and ordering some O1 or W1 tool steel, 45 minutes later, you have a wood turning chisel. There's a real good book called Toolmaking for Woodworkers. It was published in 97 by Ray Larson. Fabulous book. I have learned so much for from that. Everything from selecting different types of steels to shaping steels to heat treating steels. And it's written specifically for woodworkers, not blacksmith. So, well, with our mind, it's easy to relate to. I just looked it up on Amazon. Maybe give you folks a link. OMG, is that expensive? I saw copies selling for $110. Obviously, it's out of print and in high demand. So if you happen to see a copy of that, I'd snag it. Other things you might want to consider getting into is metal engraving. I watched an episode of Craftsman Legacy on PBS that showcased a metal engraver. Uh, he lives up in Michigan. That is such an incredible art form that if, you know, I don't know, if you're getting bored with wood carving, maybe get into metal carving. Well, they call it engraving. But it's the same concept. And Christopher Schwartz had an article in, I don't know, someplace about a metal engraver who works on hand planes. And she did this special engraving for Schwartz that was just absolutely gorgeous. Could you imagine one of your nice hand planes with this beautiful engraving on the, the, the cheek piece? Yeah, maybe in my spare time. Maybe when I retire. <laughs> like that's ever going to happen. Using metal as inlays, we kind of touched on that. But you can use brass, you can use bronze, you can use silver, you could use gold if your pocketbook is deep enough. You can use powdered metals. There was an article, I believe, in Woodworkers Journals just recently that talked about using powdered metals and either CA glue or epoxy to do different infills or to repair, you know, like a knot or something like that. Very interesting stuff. Powder coating metals. This has kind of always been a almost a voodoo type things to powder coat metal. You know, it's not rocket science. You spray metal with this powdered pigment and then you bake it. You put it in an oven. You can buy a toaster oven and do this in your woodworking shop. Not very hard. Think of the things that you could accent with a piece of powdered, powder-coated metal. Hmm. Metal patina. For this, you need to turn to David Marks. That's David J. Marks if you're going to go and look him up on YouTube. 
In fact, I've saved you the trouble. I have a link in the show notes of some... Okay, it's wood porn. That's really the only way I can describe it. Some of the absolutely incredible work that he does. Check that out. It may be a rabbit hole that you want to go down. So be creative. Do something different. Fail at something and learn. This is kind of the journey that we're on as professional woodworkers. Don't be afraid to try something different. If you have the time and hopefully you have the business just stacked up that you're turning work down like I had to do this week. Whenever I got another missed job, I had two people contact me about kitchen cabinets. One wanted some old kitchen cabinets that she was going to get rid of made into a hutch. That's an interesting concept. I could see how that would work, but of course I couldn't take it. And a, another lady wanted kind of a renew of her kitchen cabinets. And that can be very, very good good business. You go in, you might make new doors, make new drawer fronts, replace drawer slides, maybe work on the finish a little bit. If you're replacing the doors and the drawer fronts, well, you're like 80% there. Go ahead and refinish the face frame. Boom. They have a new kitchen. Several thousand dollars are in your pocket and they have not spent 32000 on getting a brand new kitchen. So it's kind of a win-win situation right there. I'd like to thank the listeners in New Baltimore, Michigan for tuning in, as well as the listeners in Rotterdam, Holland. Greatly appreciate you downloading. So as always, if you have questions about something or suggestions for new upcoming shows, this is number 50. Not exactly sure where I'm going to go in the future, please email me, roger at workingatwoodworking.com or phone number down in the show notes. Love to chat with you. And if you'd like to support the show, please buy me a cup of coffee. Again, the link in the show notes. And until next week, happy woodworking.